If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me, please, to the book of Titus. The book of Titus. When you find your spot, you may, if you will, we'll reverence the Word of God. And while you're finding your spot, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Tripp Kester to come and pray for our service today. And uh, I want to say this about him. This will be aired in a couple of weeks on our television network. And uh, we cover <clears throat> a lot of counties in the state of North Carolina. But uh, we cover uh, Davidson County. And as you know, this is uh, election time. Some people are <clears throat> in office and they're running to retain their position. And then other people are running for the first time. And we're glad that we have a man here in our church uh, who has stepped out and has decided to run for county commissioner here in uh, Davidson County. Uh, he's a man of integrity. He's a man who is faithful. He and his wife are faithful to our church. And uh, we'd like to say to our viewers who will, are listening now, some and some will be viewing this, in a couple of weeks that we stand behind this man 1,000% and uh, know and believe that he would be a breath of fresh air Amen. to uphold and to hold this position. We're thankful for him. Uh, I was able this week to address the uh, Republican Party in Davidson County and they had a lot of people to get up and they, uh, they shared their interest in the, in the office they hold or the office they are aspiring to hold. And Brother Tripp got up and uh, was a statesman. And I mean by that, uh, he said things basically based upon our Constitution and the Word of God. And those are the two elements, uh, the Bible and the Constitution that guide his life and would guide his life if he is fortunate enough to hold a position of county commissioner. And we would encourage folks to get behind him. And uh, we appreciate him so much. We're going to ask him to lead us in prayer, and then we'll read our scripture. Brother Tripp, God bless you, brother. We love you and appreciate you. I appreciate you. Let's pray. This morning, just uh, in humility, Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of being here today. There's those among us that don't have the health and the ability to be here. We just lift them up, Lord, especially the situation in Ukraine. We pray for those folks that that situation would be brought to an end speedily. Help us to be mindful to pray for them. Lord, we lift up the service to you today and uh, pray you'd fill the pastor with his Holy Spirit, that um, we'd be hearers of the word, doers of the word, and not hearers only. And uh, Lord, we just ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, everybody got your Bibles open? Now, we're not deaf and dumb. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. One verse of Scripture today in Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We could stay here for months just in this verse of Scripture. What a powerful, powerful verse. I read this last week, and I spoke to us last week in a little different direction in which I'm going today. But I want us to look at this verse for the next few minutes. Father, thank you that you have loved us so much that you would provide for us what we don't deserve. And I ask you today, should there be one in this building or beyond this building who has never come to know you, never trusted you, never confined their soul into your care, that in the next few minutes they will decide to do so. I pray, Lord, that you'll challenge those of us who are saved to be so appreciative for such a wonderful, great, salvation. And may today we be strengthened in the inner person as we are reminded once again of all that you've done for us. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for caring for us. Bless us now, I pray, around the Word of God. 
and we'll thank you for it because we ask in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. The Bible is a book about the grace of God. The Bible says as early on as the book of Genesis that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. We find grace all through the Bible. Grace is more than a woman's name. That's a good name to have. However, many times when we think about grace, we end it in external needs. For instance, we'll, we'll say, and you've heard people say this, nothing wrong with this. I'm not condemning this at all. It's wonderful. But I hear people say this. I've said this. Thank God that he gave me grace through this trial. Thank God he, he gave me grace through this adverse circumstance. Paul experienced that when he had the thorn in the flesh and he prayed and prayed on three different occasions. Lord, take this thorn away. But God gave him grace. Grace to endure that thorn in his life. All of us have talked about God's marvelous grace. We've talked about the sufficiency of his grace in the daily needs that we're confronted with in our lives. But the word grace has a greater connotation to it than that. Because if you really want to know what the grace of God is about and what the grace of God is like, we must take it in the context of our passage of Scripture today, in the context text of Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 11. Here we find he teaches us that the grace of God, first of all, has brought unto us salvation. Now it's good to have grace to help us in the time of need, but it's greater to have grace to help us when we need a Savior. And I'm so glad, I am so thankful that this Bible is a love book about a love that will not let us go. It is a love that's unspeakable and full of glory that describes in, and not only describes, but actually puts into practice how much God loved us and was willing to ex extend his grace toward us. Amen. Now the word grace is, uh, is a great word. Uh, somebody has put it in an acrostic, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. But if you want to get into the real meaning of the word grace, it is a word which means a favor that is freely done without claim or expectation of return. Secondly, it means an act beyond the ordinary, ordinary course of what might be expected. In other words, God does as much as we think it would be humanly possible for a person to do, and then he turns around and he does more on top of that. That's the way, it's abundant grace. It's not just grace, but it's super grace. It's super abundant grace. And he gives it to us, first of all, without any expectation of return. Now, I, uh, years ago, I was pastoring a church, and uh, I had just gotten there, and the church was growing. We became the fastest growing church in the county, started the first Christian school in the county, <clears throat> and my, it was amazing how God was blessing and things was taking place. And there was a man in the church, he was a uh, <clears throat> very wealthy person, owned a large business there nearby, and uh, <clears throat> he came up to me one day and he said, I want you to meet me out here uh, this week, and we established a time, and he said, I wanna, I wanna take you somewhere. And uh, he said, uh, I'm not going to tell you where, you just be here. And that's always a suspicious thing to me. I don't know if somebody's going to take me off in the woods somewhere and shoot me. I don't, know. Uh, I don't know what they've got on their mind. But he said, if you'll meet me at a particular day this week, particular time, we're going somewhere, 
And I did, and we got in the car, and we drove on for a while, and we went up in the mountains and went into a little town. And uh, when he took me down Main Street in town, he took me down, and we pulled up in front of a men's clothing store. And I'm saying, wow, I wonder what's going to happen here today. And uh, we walked in the clothing store, and they asked me what size suit I wore, and uh, I told him, and they took me over here to a particular place in the, the racks uh, that held the men's clothes. And, uh, and uh, he said, uh, pick you out a suit. I, I want to bring you over here today. And uh, I wanted to buy you a suit and I want to buy you a tie. I'm going to buy you a shirt to go with it. And I said, well, brother, I appreciate that. I don't expect that. Oh, he said, I'm glad to do it. He said, I appreciate you. I appreciate you being my pastor. And I just want to do something to let you know. He said, I can afford to do it. And I just want you to know that uh, I really appreciate you. And they said, take this uh, suit back here in this room and try it on and make sure that it fits. So I go back there and I try the suit on and uh, I come back out and uh, <clears throat> there's four other suits laying out there on the counter. And uh, <clears throat> he wanted to find out, first of all, what size suit I wore. And uh, when he found that out, while I'm trying the suit on, he goes in that same group, same size. He picks out four more suits and had four more ties laying out there on the counter. And he, and he said to me, do you like these colors? I said, beggars can't be choosy. I said, uh, yeah, I praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, he said, well, I want to buy you all of the, I walked out of there that day with five brand new suits. And I said, well, praise the Lord, God, God sure is good. Now, that's an illustration of grace. Grace goes over and beyond what you anticipate. Again, that uh, phrase I, I shared with you, an act beyond the ordinary course of what might be expected. I got in his car that day. I had no idea what we was going to do. I had no idea where we was going. And when we got there and he said, pick your suit out, I was so grateful for that. But he went over and beyond that and added to it four other suits. That's what grace does, my friend. God has given us grace. The grace of God, which bringeth salvation, hath appeared unto all men. He's not only forgiven us, but he has given us a destination. I mean, we know where we're going. Those of us who are saved today, uh, we may go out for lunch here in a little while. If the rapture doesn't take place, if it takes place, we're going to something better. Uh, but, but heaven is our home. Amen. Heaven is our destination. I like the guy that came to a preacher one day and he said, if you don't uh, quit preaching like you're preaching, he said, we're, uh, we're going we're gonna to take, uh, this was years ago, we're going to take your, your house away from you. Uh, and he said, which one are you talking about? I said, you mean you have more than one house? He said, yeah, I live in a house down here. But he said, I got a house up in heaven. He said, you may be able to take this one away, but you can't touch the one that I've got up there in glory. Oh, listen to me. Grace goes exceedingly abundantly above all that we would ask or we would think. I think one of the greatest, greatest illustrations of grace is found in the Old Testament book of Samuel. David one day is looking around his house and he gets to thinking about his former acquaintances, especially Jonathan. Saul's son was a personal friend of, of David. And uh, Jonathan uh, was a blessing. Their hearts were, were knitted together and he's no longer with him. And David gets to looking around the palace one day and he gets to thinking about yesterday and bygone years and uh, he calls one of the servants of Saul into his presence. His name was Ziba. And he said, Ziba, I, I got to thinking, is there anybody left of the house of David that I may show them kindness? And Ziba said, yes. As a matter of fact, there is a young man that's left of the house of David, uh, of the family of Jonathan, but uh, he's, he's in a foreign country. He's way off in a foreign country. 
And his name is Mephibosheth. Now, David said to Ziba, I'd like to show him some kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, I can see this taking place. I can see David sitting in his big palace. And I can see him as it's mealtime and the servants are doing their thing. And he gets to thinking about the days when he sat around the table with a bygone generation and they're no longer there. And he wants to do something because of that close relationship he had with Jonathan. And he says to Ziba, I want you to go see if you can find Mephibosheth. Now we know in the Bible when we read about Mephibosheth, that Mephibosheth at the age of five he and the nurse who was looking after him was trying to flee because they were in a state of danger. And something happened. She dropped him and did something to his back and uh, his spine. Uh, and he was, the Bible says that Mephibosheth uh, was lame on both feet. Uh, he was unable to walk. Uh, and we also find that Mephibosheth uh, is off in a foreign country. He's off in a country called Lodabar. And uh, it it would, it would be, uh, be like a red light district. It would be on the other side of the tracks. Uh, it would be in an impoverished place, uh, and it would be a terrible environment to have to live in. Uh, but uh, David said to the servant, I want you to go down in Lodabar, and I want you to find this crippled boy, and I want you to bring him to my palace. Uh, and I can see the servant as he gets uh, some of the king's chariots uh, and he gets some of the king's men uh, and they leave this expansive uh, house uh, that David's living in uh, and they make their way to Lodabar. Don't know how far off it was, uh, but it was a long ways from the king's palace. Uh, and they get, get their horses and they get their chariots uh, and they head out across the countryside uh, to go down into the red light district. Uh, and I can see those folks down there when this cavalcade of people from the king's house come rolling down the streets and the horses and the chariots and they come to pick up this little old crippled boy and people are going out and they're flooding the sides of the streets because here are representatives from the king's house and somebody might have said to Mephibosheth Mephibosheth something big's about to take place in this town today because they're representatives of the king's household and they're coming down the street we don't know what they're doing here. I have no idea of why they're here. Uh, and they're talking up and down the street. What is this uh, large group of people from the king's house? What are they representing? Uh, and uh, they might have positioned little old Mephibosheth out on the porch or put him in front of a window so he could look out and watch this group from the king's house uh, as they come by his house. Uh, and I'm sure it was a poverty stricken place. They had no money uh, and uh, it was a place uh, of, of total abject poverty. Uh, and I can just see little Mephibosheth. Maybe he's been presented uh, in a chair in front of the window and they watch him as they come in view and here comes the cavalcade from the king's house and they come right up in front of Mephibosheth's house and they say whoa. And I can hear the people in the house of Mephibosheth said what in the world's going on? What are, the, what are they trying to prove? Uh, Mephibosheth, they've stopped right outside of our house. And they get out of the chariot and they come up to the house of Mephibosheth and they knock on the door and somebody's helping look after Mephibosheth answers the door and they say, yes, can we help you? And I can hear the representative of the king as they say, do you have somebody living in this house called Mephibosheth? And they say, why, yes, yes, uh, he's a little crippled fellow. He's sitting over here in a chair. He's been watching you come down the street. May we come in? Yes, please come in. And I can see the servant and those who are with him as they come in the door and they come around and they look down at little old crippled Mephibosheth. Uh, and they said, Mephibosheth, we got some good news for you. Uh, the king has sent for you. Boy, about that time, if I was Mephibosheth, you know the first question I'd be raising, why in the world are you with me? Yeah. Why in the world would the king be interested in me? Uh, how in the world does the king know me? 
How in the world does the king know where I live? Why would he send this large group of people from the king's household all of the way down here to pick me up? And they said, Mephibosheth, we want to put you in the chariot and we want to take you back to the king's house because the king desires to see you. And I can just see Mephibosheth as he said, get that little bag over there and get those few little clothes I've got and put those clothes in that little old case over there. I want to take all of these things back with me. I don't know what's ahead of me. I don't know what to expect. Uh, but all I know is the king has sent for me. Uh, and I'm going to the king's household. Uh, oh, listen to me. I'll come back to that in just a minute. But i got to stop here for just a moment and say a few things about that. Uh, because up there in glory where the angels were worshiping the Lord and praising him. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. They'd enjoyed continual fellowship for all all of eternity. Uh, there never been a time when they'd ever been separated. There never been a time uh, when they were not together. Uh, and all of a sudden in the omnipotence uh, of God, God said, you know, we're going to create that world. We're going to create man. Man's going to fall. Uh, and uh, we've got to make some plans for him. Uh, and I want you to understand back there, they said, uh, Jesus said, I'll go down there and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll die for them. I'll provide salvation for them. Uh, and my friend in your life, and in my life, there came a time uh, when the representative from the king's household uh, came where we was. Our heavenly Zeba came where, <laughs> came where we was. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God showed up. You know what the Holy Spirit of God in essence was saying? Uh, the king has sent for you uh, when you felt your need of conviction uh, and you felt your need of salvation. Uh, it's because in grace, uh, in grace uh, and in mercy, uh, the king sent the Holy Spirit down to your house or down to the church chair or the church pew or over yonder in the shavings of some fashion, old-fashioned revival meeting under a tent or an arbor somewhere or in your living room. The king sent for you and the king sent for me. Where did he find us at? He found us in a crippled condition. My friend, because of the fall, we had been crippled. We are running away from God, not running toward God. And God said, I'm coming down there. I'm coming after you. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And my friend, he left out of glory through the person of the Holy Spirit and he came down where we happened to be. Maybe it was in your home or church. I don't know where it was at, but you can be thankful for today that the King has sent for you. And if you're not saved, the King has sent for you. He wants to save you. He wants to lavish you uh, with his grace. Uh, he's not expecting anything because there's nothing else we can do. There's nothing we can do uh, but accept the free offer uh, of conversion and salvation because it's nothing in our hands we bring uh, but it's simply to the cross we cling uh, and we come today as crippled, uh, undeserving fallen humanity uh, and the king comes and knocks on our door uh, and the king says to us uh, I desire your presence uh, and my friend uh, if you say yes to the king uh, he'll bring you into the spiritual king's household uh, and make you a son and a daughter uh, of glory uh, he wants to do it he lives to do it he longs to do it that's grace grace came down the red light district of Lodabar and old Mephibosheth is probably saying they're picking him up and taking him out in the chariot. Wow, I couldn't afford a chariot like this, but they're going to give me a free ride to town. Look at those big chargers. Look at those big horses. Look at the servant that's come to take me to the king's household. You know, I've got a sneaking suspicion on the way back. Oh, Mephibosheth is saying to Zeba, Zeba, what brought this about? Zeba, why is King David interested in me? And I hear old Zeba say, probably it's beyond me. I can't explain it. You'll have to ask him when you get there. I can't explain grace to you. 
No more than I'm making a feeble attempt to today by an illustration. I can't explain it. It's, it's over my pay grade. I can't explain it. It's beyond my ability to comprehend. I cannot do nothing but revel in the fact that God, through his grace and his mercy, loved me. And he loved you. I, the, the, look, what do you, where do you go beyond that? Where do you go beyond the love of God? You can't explain it. But thank God we don't have to explain it to experience it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have present tense everlasting life. Maybe the road got rough. Maybe the road got long. And maybe Mephibosheth said to Ziba the servant, how much farther is it to the king's house? And maybe Ziba said, well, it won't be long. Mephibosheth, I can hear Ziba say, Mephibosheth, I know the journey's long, there's a lot of dust, and the ride's rough. But Mephibosheth, when you get to the end of the journey, when you come into the king's palace, when you see the royalty and the riches of the king, Mephibosheth, it'll be worth the ride. And let me tell you, the road gets rough and there's some big boulders and there's some deep crevices and some deep routes that we have to endure. The powers of hell, the missiles of hell itself are unleashed against God's people in this world. It's a constant fight. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, For when I would do good, evil's present with me. What I should do, I don't do. What I don't do, I do. It was a constant battle. The devil and the demons of hell are, are, are trying with all of their ability to shoot every missile they've got against God's people and against the church of the redeemed. And sometimes it gets rough. Sometimes we feel like we're up to our neck in the water and we're going to go under it any minute. And then grace shows up. And then we're reminded, I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. It's the price of the precious, pure, holy, eternal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm one of these days when this journey ends and it consummates, whether it be by rapture glory or whether it be by transfer from this world into the presence of the Lord through the cemetery of the dead, whichever way we know we're going to make it safe. Paul said, whether I live, I'm the Lord's. Whether I die, I'm the Lord's. So whether I live or whether I die, I belong to him. I am the Lord's. And my friend, through it all, through tears and trials and downtime and bad time, even though there's good times, but through it all, one of these days, like a Mephibosheth when we get to the end of the journey and we look upon him whom having not seen we love and, and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory when we come to the end of the journey and we step into the presence of the king in all of his glory we'll say like the queen of Sheba surely the half was never shown me and never told me oh it's going to be worth it at the end of the journey when in his presence we behold his sweet face his sweet countenance uh, and we look upon the one uh, who came down here that we might go up there. It's going to be worth the journey to step into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mephibosheth sit up straight son. We'll be there before long. I can see David as he comes in his, this, this huge Palace. I always like to, uh, I always like to compare it. I contrast it, and I know that the contrast is small, but I like to contrast the place that David lived, looking like something like the Biltmore House. If you've ever been up there and slobbered over that a few times, you know what I'm talking about. All the riches and the finery, and I can just, I like to. I like to picture David as he, 
as he comes into this huge banqueting room. And here's a long table. And all around the room, it's just lined in gold. The finest furniture. The servants in the kitchen, they've been a good while fixing the meal. Plenty of food. They're, they're, they're waiting for the king to show up. And, uh, and, and, and the servants are standing by. They're waiting for the king and his family to come in so they can serve him. And I can just see David now as he's making his way into the banqueting hall. And I can see him as he takes his seat at the head of the table. And some of his family sitting on the right side and some of his family sitting on the left side. And he's had his servants to put a chair out. Because he knows that there's good possibility that any time now, any time now, Mephibosheth may show up. And so I can just see David and all of his servants as they're sitting around the table. And the servants, maybe they start serving the drinks and, and you can smell the food coming out of the kitchen and, and the servants are getting ready to, to bring the food out and set it on the table and David sits down there at the table uh, and David looks down one side of the table and he looks down the other side of the table and there's that chair is missing. And David might say something like this. Has anybody heard anything from Ziba? Has anybody heard anything from Mephibosheth? Do we know if they're nearby? Do, do, has anybody got any word that they're on the way? And I'm, I can, I'm imagining now that, uh, that as he's looking around, he sees an empty And I like to imagine that they hear a shuffle out in the hallway. And David looks towards the door. And here comes Ziba and the servants. And they're shuffling. And they're carrying Mephibosheth in their hands and in their arms. And I can see him maybe as he comes through the door and David points over here. Right there's his chair. Been waiting for him. Been waiting for him. You know, I honestly believe that our Savior is looking forward to the day when whether it's raptured glory or by the way of the grave, I believe our Savior is looking at the empty chair, so to speak, and he said, I'll sure be glad when they arrive. Amen. You know why? Because he, he's purchased us. We're not trash. We're family. I want you to know we're important to him. We're important to him. But I happen to believe that over there in his presence, our loved ones who have gone home to be in the presence of the Lord. I just happen to believe that they too yes, sir. are waiting Amen. and they're looking yeah. and they're longing. I like to say it this way. I know in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm going to build a mansion for you. I know we've got one because Jesus said it and Peter said it's, it's, it's preserved and reserved for us in the presence of the Lord. I just, I just happen to think, and, and, and you can say I'm out of my tree if you want to, but you won't be the first one that said it, and you won't be the last one that said it. But I just happen to believe, and my dear wife might have already been by there, and might be saying, well, along with some of my loved ones and some of my dear church members that I've buried down through the years. Wonder when Ron's going to show up. Wonder how long it'll be before Ron gets here. Because I believe our loved ones over there are looking for us. I believe they're waiting for us. I know this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when the Lord returns, it says those who sleep with God, he's going to bring with him. Our loved ones are coming back with him for the transformation of glorification. And I can just see them as they come through the door and they're carrying that little cripple. And David said, right over there, put him right there. 
And a servant pulls the chair out and they sit that little old crippled boy in that chair and they push him up to the table. I'm just looking at Mephibosheth. I'm seeing in my mind as he looks up at the head of the table and he sees King David sitting there and he looks around and he said, boy, this is not like a little bar. I'm seeing him as he says, wow, what in the world did I ever do to deserve this? Mephibosheth, you didn't do nothing. It's the grace of the king. When we get to glory, it's nothing we've done. It's the grace of the king that's going to bring us into his presence. I hear David. The Bible says he says this. It doesn't say where he says it. So I, I, I like to dream. I can see David in my mind as he stands up at the head of the table and he says what we're told in the Bible. He points to his servants and he says to all of his servants in the room, from this day forward, whatever Mephibosheth needs, you see that those needs are supplied. And servants, I want you to listen to me. From this day forward, when it's time to eat in this banqueting hall, I want you to make sure that Mephibosheth sits at my table with me. That's grace. That's grace. Bring him from Lodabar to the king's table. That's grace. And then I like this. Hallelujah. I love this. I love what I'm about to tell you so good. If you don't like it, that's all right. You go on to sleep. I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> when they brought this little crippled boy in, Mephibosheth, and they set him down at that table, and that beautiful tablecloth went across the top of that table and came down and laid in his lap. Those little crippled legs didn't show any longer. They're covered by the grace of the king. Sitting at the table you would never know he was crippled because he's sitting there looking around. He's so amazed at what's going on. Nobody knows other than the fact they brought him in and set him at the table. Those little old crippled legs don't show when he's sitting at the king's table. And the infirmities, the sin, and all of the illusions that the devil sows in the heart and the hearts of his children when we stand in his presence, it's no more. Because the Bible said we stand in his presence without spot and without wrinkle. Amen. We stand in his presence, as Paul said to the church of Colossa, we stand in him complete. Yes, sir. You're talking about grace. David never said to Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, you may sit at my table if you can pay the rent for living in this house. No, he said, Mephibosheth, this is on me. Amen. From now on, you don't have to worry about food. From now on, you don't have to worry about a place to stay. From now on, I'm giving you some of Saul's property and the servants are going to serve that property for you. They're going to tend that field for you and you don't have to worry about it. All you've got to do is enjoy the blessings that through grace, I'm going to rain on you. Amen. And one of these days for all of eternity, we're going to enjoy the eternal grace of God that he's wrought to us and in us through a marvelous salvation that consummates in his presence. Sin 
reached out and touched the ends of the earth. Salvation reaches out. Likewise. And where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. Amen. True story. There was a train station years ago, and I'm finished. A man of an orphanage, the superintendent of an orphanage was standing at the train station because there were some orphans coming in whose parents had left or died and the kids had nowhere to go. So the train pulls in and the superintendent of the orphanage is standing there waiting to greet the kids as they get off the train. <clears throat> Little kids get off the train. He stands there. He reaches down and he picks them up one at a time and he places a kiss on their cheek. And he welcomes them. One by one. Finally, the last one off of the train was a little girl. She walked down the steps and she got over in the background away from the rest of the kids. And when you looked at the little girl, you noted that her face was marred with scars. And they found out that this little girl and her parents was in their house and it caught on fire. And her mama and dad both perished in the flames. And she was severely burned and her face was marred with scars. And she waited to the last because she felt like she was a misfit. She felt like the superintendent wouldn't be interested in her because of the way she looked. He picked those little kids up one at a time in his arms and he kissed them on the cheek, sent them over to where there's putting him transportation to get them to the orphanage. Finally, when the last kid came by, this little girl was standing over by herself, all marred and scarred. And the superintendent looked at her and said, honey, come over here. And she looked up at him and she said, sir, I know I'm ugly. My mom and dad died in the fire. I was severely burned. And I know you wouldn't be interested picking me up, kissing me over this marred face. But sir, if you could just put your arm around me and give me a little hug, that'd be fine. That superintendent said, no such thing. He ran over and grabbed that little girl and put her up in his arms and he smothered her face in kisses. He said, honey, you're loved here. We don't look at the external. You're loved here. He took her into the orphanage and looked after her. We're all marred. And we're all scarred by sin. And I don't know why he'd be concerned about us. I feel like a little girl standing off to the side. Lord, why would you be concerned? Why would you exhibit grace towards me? But he runs to us in our sins. And he said, I love you. As we reach out to him and say, yes, Jesus. I trust you. I accept you as my Savior. Thank God with all of the scars and all of the blemishes and all of the bruises. His marvelous grace gives us what we do not deserve. And he draws us close to his bosom and he says, mine, 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 eternally mine. He never done it for the fallen angels. They're chained, many of them. 
in everlasting darkness awaiting the judgment of the great day. But he did it for us. His grace was exhibited to us. Nothing we deserve, nothing we deserve, but he did it out of grace. Our text verse said, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. If you're in this building, we stand to our feet. If you're in this building saved, you have become a recipient of God's marvelous grace. Listen to me. If you're saved, God came after us in Lodabar. He's brought you from Lodabar to the king's palace. If you're not saved, he's at Lodabar. He's ready to pick you up. Amen. He's ready to take you positionally to the king's palace. He wants to establish his grace upon you. But the only way he can do it is if you have a willing heart for him to do that. And if you'll say yes to him, he'll reach out like that superintendent. He'll put you up, draw you close to his bosom and love on you the rest of your life and take you into his presence when it's all said and done. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who'd be here today by an upraised hand? You'd say, Pastor, I've never been saved. Please pray for me. I, I need the grace that you've talked about today. I've never been saved. Slip your hand up and let me pray for you. Anywhere in the building? Yes, anyone else? You're here today and you say, I've been saved. I know I'm saved, but good night. I'm, I'm not as close to the king's house as I ought to be. I need to draw closer to the Lord. No doubt about it. I need to live more. I need to live more in his favor than I am at this very moment. Things in my life as a Christian, I need to get closer to the Lord. I see hands going up all over the building. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Why don't those of you who've just raised your hand, I'm not trying to entrap you. I'm just saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you just slip out and come down here and let's pray about it around this altar. Everybody that the Lord called, he called them publicly. There's something about public Confession that God honors others. Would you come on right now? Let's tell Jesus about it. Oh, he loves you. His grace has been manifested toward you. He loves you with a love that will not let you go. Are there others that will come? Father, I want to thank you today for grace. Thank you that we're recipients of that. Thank you for allowing us to be recipients of it. And I pray you'll bless us. During this moment, those who've come, minister to them. Others that need to be ministered to, help them to do so in Jesus' name. We sing this stanza. If others need to come, would you slip out and come right now?